I'm Rich Folley, your host, and I'm sitting here right now with Homer Hickam, who's the author of a brand new book called Carrying Albert Home. And you're carrying Albert actually yourself right now, it seems. Albert is an alligator, and you have brought one with you. <laughs> yeah, uh, my wife got me this uh, when I started writing Carrying Albert Home because it's the, this, the somewhat true story of a man, his wife, and her alligator who make a thousand mile journey from West Virginia to Florida. And she said, Do you have any idea what it'd it be like to have an alligator in the car with you? And I confess, I kind of missed that in my resume. So she got me this, uh, this little doll and we put it in the back seat and we, as we were driving along we were thinking, okay, so Albert's in the back seat and uh, he maybe needs to do his business so we need to take, when we stop we need to take him for a walk and, and, so, and needs to be fed or whatever. And we, just, we would go there and people would see us with this little doll and they just loved him. There was something um, just so nice and cuddly about, uh, about this alligator. So we've ended up, we took him to Australia uh, last year and um, the, uh, the airline hostess just loved him and brought me free drinks because I've walked yeah. into bars in Paris holding this. How does that work for you? It, it takes 20 years off your age instantly. <laughs> All the barmaids just come rushing over. So let me recommend uh, yeah. uh, every, 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 um, every young man should have his own uh, Albert to carry in. Give it a shot, Homer. Give it a I'm shot. Try. It might work. Yeah. Let's tell everybody a little bit. <laughs> Homer is, so the, the, the subtitle, as you mentioned, is The Somewhat True Story of a Man, His Wife, and Her Alligator. Not his, but hers. Um, Albert is the alligator. Albert is the alligator, and he is uh, uh, the couple in question here, the man and his wife, happens to be my parents before they were my parents, Homer and Elsie Hickam. Elsie, whose maiden name was Lavender, um, she grew up in the coal fields in southern West Virginia uh, in the 1920s, just as my dad did. He asked her to marry him. She said, heck no, I'm going to Florida and live with my rich Uncle Aubrey in Orlando. I've seen pictures of rich Uncle Aubrey standing in front of a dented old trailer with kind of a dead palm tree. He was rich in many ways. Um, and so, sounds like it. Uh, so in Orlando, uh, she met a young man whose name was Buddy Epson, and he later turned out to be the famous Hollywood actor. Went on to be Uncle. He's best known for Uncle Jed and the Beverly Hillbillies. Of course, and yeah. they fell in love. They were going to get married. He got the call to Hollywood. Went off. Didn't write her for a long, long time. She went up to the coal fields to visit her parents. One thing after another, kismet took over. Destiny. She ended up marrying my future father, Homer Hickam. But Buddy sent Elsie a wedding gift, a very special wedding gift. He sent her a baby alligator yeah, to remind her of their what time. What kind of wedding gift is a baby alligator? That's a alligator. very good question. <laughs> now, later on in the book, we're, we're going to meet Buddy, and he's going to explain that. Yeah. But what Elsie takes is, oh my gosh, Buddy still loves me, because he wrote a kind of a little love letter in there. Remind us, remind you of our wonderful days in Florida. Love, Buddy. And she named it the, the alligator Albert, raised it in the kitchen sink and in the bathtub until it got so big that it chased my future father out in the yard one day and he started yelling, all right, Elsie, it's either me or this alligator. And after a few days of thinking it over, because she wasn't sure about this marriage, she said, okay, but we have to take him home to Orlando. And this began the thousand mile journey that they took from in 1935 in the midst of a great depression. And this part is true of the somewhat true story. It, that part is true. Yeah. Now, over the years they told me, uh, and out of sequence, they, they would tell me stories about when they carried Albert home. And um, they, would, they would tell me like they were caught in a great 1935 hurricane. Uh, in, in, uh, in Florida, and they met Ernest Hemingway right before that. So they'd tell me that, and then years later they would tell me that, oh, uh, Homer and Albert accidentally uh, was uh, taken into the Coast Guard and they had to fight smugglers. And by the way, Elsie met a ghost at the same time. Oh, and they met John Steinbeck on the right. So he told me all these stories out of order, and I kept thinking about it, and I would tell a little, uh, kind of a truncated story about this with a nice punchline, but I can't tell because it t gives away the end of, this, of the book, but um, when I put it all together, I realized they were telling me why and how they were able to stay together for over 60 years of marriage and never agreed on anything. Yeah. It was because of this great adventure that they had when they carried Albert home. Yeah, this is a, it's a, there's, a there's a quirky element to the story, obviously, oh, yeah. but there's a love story behind it. Um, and there's a strange Buddy Upson element that you talked about as well, but, yeah. but it is about finding that bond in a marriage. And, and it's also built as a prequel of sorts, not really, but I mean to your original book, uh, Rocket Boys, yeah. which a lot of people know 
from the book and some people know from the movie that right. was made, October Sky, about your life. One of the reasons, uh, Rich, that I started telling this story was because I thought the movie had not done justice to my parents. The book did, but uh, it made well, Elsie look like a wimp and she was nothing like that. I mean, she, first place, she made it clear right from the very start that she hated being in Coldwood, West Virginia, that uh, she had these vast ambitions and she was stuck as a coal miner's wife, but yet she stayed with my father. So why did she do that? Um, and ultimately, when I put it all together to tell this story, um, was that it's because they had this shared adventure where they started off, uh, Elsie definitely not thinking necessarily that she wanted to stay in this marriage, but they had all these shared adventures and experiences that ultimately brought them together enough that it kept their marriage together for all those years. But they had to keep telling and retelling the story to remind themselves of that time when they had this great adventure and they had Albert. And Albert is a special little alligator. He's, he's almost a, a spirit. And there's some fantasy to this book. It's somewhat, it's, I like to say this book is all true except for the parts that are not, and they're true too. Because those parts that are not still have the kernel of truth to them and they're told for a reason. And sometimes it's fantasy. I mean, Albert is just a pair of glowing red eyes while my father is hanging out with a serial killer. And so, <laughs> so I, you bring out all, the, all these kind of things that people go, you know, this, it, it, it leads them to think about things more than just a road trip. It's much more than a road trip. I think what I loved about the book so much is the idea of the bonding nature of an adventure. Um, and that here is two people who maybe weren't sure, um, but they went on this wild ride together and it not only bonded them at the time, but to your point, it stretched out as a bonding element of their marriage for all these years, yeah. for all those many years. Well, you know, I, people say, well, what's the ultimate moral of this story, Homer? And I go, well, if you're having trouble in your marriage and maybe with your long-term relationship, the best thing you can do is put an alligator in the back seat of your car and head for Florida. Yeah. <laughs> because well, I don't think you should ever marry anybody or really enter into any kind of long-term relationship until you take a bad trip with them, yeah. and uh, because then the real person will come out during during that. You know, the honeymoons to Jamaica and all that. That doesn't really tell you who this person is that you just you just married. Uh, so it, it definitely worked for my parents. Yeah. So what are the lessons one has from driving all that way with a with a snapping alligator in the back of your car? <laughs> well, I mean, Albert was not a snapper. He was very sweet. He liked to turn over on his stomach, according to my mom, and he'd get his little tummy rubbed, and he would make a little yeah 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 sound little happy sound or no 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 when he was uh, unhappy. Mm -hmm. There was also a rooster um, and I never asked my parents why was there a rooster on this trip because they would often mention the roosters in, in some parts of the story that they would tell and, and not mention them the next time but, but then the next time I heard the story of the rooster was back I never asked them why, is this ro why was this rooster along as well and so we say right in the book up front um, it, it stars Homer, who, th who thought what he did caused the journey, Elsie, who thought what she said caused the journey, Albert, who actually caused the journey, and the rooster, whose presence is not entirely understood. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, so much of your life has been right. I mean, you've, you've done so many different things in your life. Your, your bio reads like a, like a person who's just trying a lot of different things. <laughs> um, and yet, the story is rife with, you know, amazing tales that you then bring to life in these wonderful books. When yeah. did you decide that your life would make interesting reading for other people as well? Well, you know, I, I thank God every day that I had such interesting parents. While I was living with them, I didn't, I didn't thank God for it. But looking back on it, they taught me so, so many lessons about life and love. And even I was getting these lessons even when I didn't, didn't realize it. Um, Actually, I, I never intended to get into the memoir, or in this case, kind of a quasi-memoir um, writer. I had written a, a book called Torpedo Junction, which was a military history bestseller. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that, it took me 15 years of research, so I thought that that was kind of the genre that I would work in. But I was asked to write a short article for a Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine. I couldn't think of anything else to write, so I wrote about when I was a kid growing up in Colwood, West Virginia, and I built rockets because it was kind of had, had a little bit of a space and rocket you know, type of theme. And as soon as that 
that came, while I was writing it, I realized I was onto something. And sure enough, when it came out, next thing I know, it's a bidding war for the book Rocket Boys and yeah. Universal Studios and knocking Jake my Gyllenhaal door. And Jake playing you. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, you look at me and say, <laughs> yeah, that's Jake, right? <laughs> I often, when I give speeches, I apologize to all the young ladies for not actually being uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. But Rocket Boys was so well accepted that I've written uh, in a lot of different genres. But ultimately, when I come back to writing the memoir, or in this case, the somewhat true story, um, I, feel, I feel the power somehow. I feel the energy, and, I, and I'm on to something. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what it is. It's almost like I have to be dragged back to write about Colwood. I try, I try everything else, the Josh Thurlow series, the World War II series, done well, but nothing like the memoirs. Um, it's just like, for some reason, I, I was at the right time and the right place and had the right mental acuity, I guess, to remember everything that happened when I was growing up in Colwood and to remember all these stories that uh, my parents told me. And that seems to really work out well for me. It sure has. And, you know, that's a recurring theme with a lot of the writers we talk to today. They know when they're on to something and it feels wonderful and they you just do. have to go down that trail. And you do. I, you can, I, could, I could almost feel it when I was writing Carrying Albert Home. I was feeling the same. Uh, internal tension that I felt when I wrote Rocket Boys. I could just feel the flow. And it's almost, uh, sometimes it's, it's almost what they used to call automatic writing. It's almost like somebody else is inhabiting your body and they're writing it for it. Yeah. And as you're writing, you go, my God, this is pretty good, but I don't know what I'm doing here. You know? <laughs> but it, and, and then, of course, all the magic comes out in a rewrite, ultimately. Yeah, well, what a great feeling, though. <laughs> well, the book is Carrying Albert Home, the somewhat true story of a man, his wife, and her alligator. And you and your alligator, Homer, are welcome here anytime. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Please. I appreciate uh, it. We'd love to have you again. Thanks so much for being you bet, here. You buddy.